Okay, go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning coffee house. I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Center for Functional Nutrition. And it's a, a beautiful, gorgeous morning here in Meaford, Ontario. And we're so glad that you have all decided to join us this morning. I just wanted to make one quick announcement. Next Sunday, September 27th, we will not be having a coffee house because we are attending our first web invention. So rather than convention, this is a web invention. So we're looking forward to it. We'll be in front of our uh, computers for, for most of the weekend. So um, it is our mission to better people's lives and to be a force for good in the world. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we have this coffee house every Sunday. We enjoy it and I know that many, many other people do. So Brian, I'm going to give the coffee house over to you and you can go ahead. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, yes, welcome everybody and welcome to those of you that are jumping on here. We're, we're very happy to be joining and connecting here on our coffee house. And this is a place where we get to feature incredible people in the community uh, who have a voice and who have expertise and knowledge and are thought leaders and people that we can all learn from and grow with. Um, and it's a very fortunate opportunity that we get to do it in this virtual space together. So thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing us to bring this to all of you uh, every Sunday. So without further ado, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our featured speaker today, uh, Catherine Taylor, who has become a dear friend of mine. Uh, I feel very blessed to call her a friend. I feel honored. Um, and she's also just an absolutely incredible practitioner. Um, simply one of the most um, professional and uh, skilled people I've ever met when it comes to uh, people and emotions and spirituality and weaving that all together in a way that is accessible literally to anybody. And she has a number of different techniques that she uses. She's the author of the best-selling book, The Inner Child Workbook, which came out in the early 90s. And I'm really excited for her to be with us today um, because she actually has a new book and I've gotten a sneak peek at it and it's brilliant, of course, um, but she's going to be sharing uh, parts of that and she's going to be weaving together something for all of us today that um, is going to be very relatable and certainly something that, um, of course, we can all benefit from, uh, especially during the times that we're in. So um, again, Catherine, such an honor to call you a friend and just brilliant that you're gonna be sharing with all of us today. So without further ado, Catherine, please say hello to everybody and let us know how you got to be here and what you'll be sharing with us today. Well, that proverbial question, how did you get here and where have you been? Thank God I was a breech baby, so, I never know where I'm going. I always just have reflection on where I've been. Um, you know, I kind of feel like I uh, contracted for what I'm involved in at this point long before I came into this physical form. And what I'm gonna talk about today, if some of you are tuning in and you don't have a clue, you're gonna be in for a real surprise. But if you're someone that has a loved one that has crossed over, has made their transition and you long to connect with them, or if you're someone that a loved one has passed on and you feel like there were words that you didn't get to express or issues you didn't get to resolve, then you're going to be interested in this subject and in this book that is still a work in progress. Um, my hope is to have it available by November 6th, but it just keeps, it's just not ending. <laughs> I keep thinking I have the ending and then I have another experience and I have to go back to square one. But it's basically the story about the relationship with my brother named John. 
And John, I was five years older than John. And when John came into this world, I was at that tender age where he was just like my little doll. You know, I mean, I longed to take care of him. I did take care of him. Mom tells a lot of stories about how she would, uh, you know, find me in his crib, kind of feeding his bottle so she didn't have to wake up. And later, like when he was two or three, he got the measles and I came home from school every, every day to put calamine, mount, lo, calamine lotion on him because he was, he, there was some sort of connection that I felt like I needed to care give him. And that continued through our life, although um, he didn't sustain wanting to be given to, which is part of our story. Um, but it did inspire this strong soul contract between us. And so when he passed away, which he did November 6th in 2018, the last couple of years of our life really gave us an opportunity to reconnect in a way. And what was curious about this is that, is that um, John and I had been close and then, as you'll read in the history, there's a time when we have a lot of dissonance. And this fits into a lot of the rest of my family history. And, and I did not want to write that family history. It's like I was kicking and screaming when I was getting ready to write the book. And actually, uh, one of the things I'm really blessed for is that I have a lot of people in my life, both colleagues and friends, that support me. And one of those is a man that I think you're going to meet at some point, Don Snyder, who is another Akashic Records consultant in the Twin Cities area. And he and I were doing an exchange and I was talking about the book and he was bringing through information about John. And I was reluctant. I was kind of fighting uh, having to write this. And I was saying, yeah, I just don't think they need that much backstory, you know. And <laughs> John said, no, you've got to get into it. You've got to get into the feelings. You know, he's bringing this through, through Don, and, or Don, and he says, you know, you've got to relate to it with feelings. And, well, of course, if you're a creator, you know that you can't have people relate to the feelings unless you're feeling them. I couldn't write this like a grocery list that I was going to target with. I, I had to kind of relive it, and it was painful. It was, I didn't want to go back to all of those. And a major part of this uh, happened in, uh, during the time that uh, the George Floyd process was going on. And one of the things you read about is, is a banishment that I have, uh, have in my history from my parents when I was involved with a man of color. And so of course I was writing about this and then that happens and then that, opens up a series of conversations between this, this man who I was involved 30 years ago. So, but we've remained friends and, and, but it brought it into a whole different light. So it was like a lot of processing. And I was very thankful that I had the tools that I had, but I was one of those people that I wanted contact. Um, I had words to uh, say to John, I had words to say to my father after he passed. This wasn't a new process for me. But with John, it was different. And it was different because we had more preparation. And I kind of went off on a tangent, but what I was beginning to say about the last two years of his life is that he had a series of aneurysms. And what was interesting for me is that our lives were not real entangled at that time. And so any contact we had was mostly by phone. I'd go visit him, but, but when he started having his aneurysms, I started really doing a lot of spiritual work in the unseen. And so we established this relationship or reestablished this relationship soul to soul. And what was interesting for me, which was not the experience of people that were directly in his life. And, and I remained very, sensitive to that and conscious of that. But the parts of John's brain that got compromised in the aneurysms were more that judgmental part of him. So all the scrutiny that I had witnessed began to fade and more of John's childhood relationship like me for, with, with me came forward. And an example of this was after his second 
aneurysm. It was just, it was just heart wrenching because he really went into a non communicative state and he didn't remember his wife. He didn't remember his children. He was glazed over most of the time. And about two weeks after that happened, I don't know if I can tell this. By now, you guys know I'm a big crybaby. So if I cry, you'll, you'll be used to it. But I went to visit him. And when I walked in, it was three weeks into this. And mind you, he hadn't remembered Jody and the girls at this point. And um, the nurse said, John, do you know who this is? And he said, yes, it's my sister, Kathy. And it was such a, one of those moments where it was wonderful that he was remembering and painful that he hadn't remembered others. And there were thousands of moments like that, that had that duality, that dichotomy, that was unique to my experience with John and such a contrast to those who were close and very personally involved and were beginning to have to grieve their loss of John on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that made this relationship very unique. And so by the time he crossed over, um, I was doing a lot of that work. And what surprised me with this was the different shades of grief that really occurred. And again, I, I want to talk about the fact that, that not everybody would be inspired to go as deeply into a, a, a what I call the quintessential long-term, long-distance relationship. Not every soul is going to be interested in continuing. Not every human is going to be inspired to. There's not going to be that bridge. But for those of you who are, for those of you who are, are wanting a map for this and wanting validation for this, that's what John and I hope to offer you in bringing our story together. And I brought it to you and we brought it together. There was a lot of collaboration, some welcomed, some unwelcomed, <laughs> so I'll talk about it in a minute. But, um, you know, we're trying to bring it in a way that invites you at your own pace to open up to dissolving the veil between the physical and non-physical. And boy, is there a need on the planet for that. Because as I opened up and dealt with some of my obstacles to really believing and trusting that this could happen, but my whole, the, the whole um, landscape of my spiritual openness has just become so, more, so much more colorful. And I'm one that has been pretty awake for quite a while. And when I am in my professional life and working with others and helping them through the records, connecting to those loved ones, I have no opposition, but I also have no attachment and I had no longing. So with the longing and attachment came the doubt because I was so afraid that I wanted it so badly that I was making it up. I was afraid that I wanted some continued relationship with John that I was making it up. And so one of the things that I really valued when I had so much resistance is I also had a lot of support around me. I had friends who were very validating of it. I had friends who, as this progressed, would say, so what's new with you and John lately? You know, as if it was just everyday affair. But I also had colleagues like Don, who I mentioned, and, and others that assisted me and could validate, yes, this is real. And a real game changer in that came for me when I did this very powerful uh, session with Samantha, who's a medium out in Ireland. And a friend of mine's mother had died, so she gifted me this uh, present. And it was a delight. And some of the surprises that happened in that was that she started bringing through this real feel of John. And, and Samantha is this real kind of proper Irish woman. John's not. <laughs> John had, you know, some of his pushiness. And, he said, you know, it's like he was excited. And this was like five months into it. And we'd gone through some of 
my grief and his adjustments and that's covered in the in the story but by this time it's like you know he was really pushing me you got to stay open you got to stay grounded you know you're my portal and you got to keep me real you know and he gave little bits and one of them that was just such a delight that took me a couple of weeks to get was that john in his junior play happened to play the role of harvey the invisible rabbit now if some of you know that story it's james stewart and it was a play that was made into a movie and james stewart is operating in his world with this invisible rabbit and everybody thinks he's crazy right well so when I think, I don't know, it was, it was like early in the 70s. And for one of the Christmas presents to my siblings, I took this plaque, this wooden plaque, and I shellacked a picture of my sister and her husband on theirs, a picture of my brother and his wife. But John was just out of high school. He didn't have a wife. So I took a picture of Harvey and shellacked it on there for him, which I have to say he wasn't real excited about. I. I say in the book, I can't really remember seeing those hung anywhere, so I don't think it was one of their favorite gifts. But in the reading, John is showing Samantha this, this, you know, plaque. But she can't quite get that it's a picture, and I'm not quite connecting it until two weeks later, it's like, oh my God, that's Harvey. And then, of course, I frantically began trying to look for that picture because, of course, I knew by that time I was going to be doing a book. And so about a week later, I'm driving down the freeway, and this is how John started impulsing me, is all of a sudden I heard, call Carol. Well, Carol is the wife of Steve, who was a classmate of John's. And so fortunately, I have Siri, and I say, Siri, you know, call Carol. And so Carol gets on the phone and I said, Carol, does Steve by any chance have, have uh, his high school annual? Because I knew he kept him close. Within 10 minutes, I had that picture of Harvey. And the minute I did that, John kind of comes back and he said, I did that. And by this time, he was taking credit for anything like that that happened. In the, in the uh, reading itself, Samantha and I are talking and there's just pearl after pearl after pearl in that reading. It really changed it for me. But the crowning pearl was she and I were talking about Sean, who's our nephew. And Sean was really close to John. I was getting ready to go see Sean in New York. We meet for, well, we have been meeting every year for the Tribeca Film Festival. And so we're talking about Sean and I look down at my cell phone and I say to Samantha, my God, Samantha, Sean's calling right now. And so she said, well, do you want to answer it? And so I answer it and Sean comes on and gets to say hi to John. And of course, John says, I did that. So from then on, it's like, it's like I had no original thought myself. <laughs> Anything that would happen that was cool like that in my life, John would say, I did that, you know? And so that really escorted a new phase. And what was interesting about this process is there was a continual adjustment and expansion and the incredible layers of grief that I always had to go through, you know, because I didn't believe it and then I'd get validated and then I'd expand. And then we went through other places where, you know, John was real present as he moved, this was interesting, he moved from being pretty unconscious to being conscious. And there's one place where we're talking and walking and and he looks at me and he said, you know, when you go into your meditations, you're just trying too hard. Just because I'm dead, you don't have to expand that high. He said, to tell you the truth, I'm not that much higher than you. You've been working your whole adult life. And he said, I had to die to even match you, you know. So then there's this period where we're walking in tandem, shoulder to shoulder. And I, and I call that part of the book, Walking and Talking. And it's like we're walking around the lake and he's just, you know, we're having the conversations that I always wanted to have when he was here. You've heard of the principle, or maybe you haven't, but I'm an addictions counselor and I deal with relationship addiction. And there's this, there's this uh, piece of, of relationships where we get addicted to the potential. We know what can exist and we keep trying. We do that in our families. We do that in our love relationships. We do it in almost every relationship. If I can just say it right, if I can just hang in there, maybe they'll finally be able to meet me. 
What's beautiful about this experience is even though John had to die to do that, it's a story about how he becomes conscious and how that gets fulfilled over and over and over again. Now, I can't guarantee that would be your story. All we're trying to do is inspire people to, to cross that bridge if, they're decide, if, if their impulse to do it. Not everybody will be. Not everybody's going to grieve in the same way. I learned a long time ago, not everybody's here for the same reason. I used to have so many judgments about people that weren't on a spiritual path. You know, I would talk to them and they'd just be so, so monetarily involved and stuff. And my judgment would be, God, what a waste of a human body, you know? And then I quickly learned, how do I know what they're here to learn? Some people are just here to learn how to na navigate in the physical world. It's not their soul's agenda to expand spiritually. And so I've shifted a lot and that really came in handy here. What else came in handy was my work with the teachings of Abraham. And one sentence came through really loud and clear. And somewhere in this process, I remember I heard Abraham say, we don't continue relationships, talking about us in human form. We don't continue relationships with those who have croaked, as they say, because you don't expect to. Well, that just kind of, you know, fueled my expectation to pursue this. And as I said, it, it was just fascinating to watch the adjustments. And one was that during the walking and talking phase, John's really present in the way that I always wanted him to be. But then there's a transition. And we're meeting at the veil, but now John's coaxing me to meet him on the other side of the veil. Well, what that required is that as John grew in his spiritual self, he slowly let go of his ego, right? And that attachment. Well, then I was called on to do the same. And I'm called on to let go of my earthly self and my control, uh, which he reminded me of a lot, and to really trust him. And in order to do that, I had to let go of who I knew him to be and discover his new vibrational signature. Well, this brought us into the work of Alicia Power. And that's one of the reasons you may have read in the invite that I am hosting a, an, an Equinox call where I'm going to play one of her recordings that she's played for our, our community that she has and, and has welcomed us to share that. And, but this whole thing, it's like I was sitting at the computer and all of a sudden, it's like I was robotic. And I was looking at this email from uh, Ian Schelling, Schelling, I think is his name, Shelley, I'd never heard of. And he's got a summit called the, Wor the, uh, the World of uh, Ancient Wisdom. I go in, I sign up for it, I scroll down, I find Alicia Powers thing, I listen to it, and boom, John and I are off and running to these meditations where every day I'm joining him in this elevator of light and we expand and we go through all these different layers of healing. And I say about Alicia that she, her work is Abraham on steroids. What Abraham does for us on the planet is really invites us to give validity to our vortex, give validity to the law of attraction, give validity to our inner being. What Alicia does is kind of the other side of what I do for the inner child. And I love that about being on both sides of the veil with her because I've spent 40 years really working and championing the personality so that the adult self can embrace the adult, the inner child and fragments of the soul and bring them into the, the capacity to then expand into our soul purpose. Well, now Alicia takes us by the hands. She, for the last 40 years, is a spiritual intuitive who has been working with this high echelon of spiritual teachers, spiritual tutors, creator beings, which take us to the next level. And you go on all these healings. What was nice is John and I were doing this training together. 
we'd get in the elevator and we'd go and we'd meet up with these spirit teachers and they would begin to do these healings on the energetic blueprints within our souls that kept John and I from colluding and, and commingling to do this process, not only to write the book, but, but as he's assured me, we're in this now as, as for the rest of my life. And not only are we in it, but I've been having this kind of relationship with my husband here. He and I do a lot of spiritual work. And you might imagine that if John had dissonance with me in this lifetime, he never kind of found his equilibrium with Arthur. He was always, they didn't have much time together, but he found our relationship somewhat awkward. Now it's like he adores Arthur. He said the other day, because I did another medium thing with, with Samantha, and he said, oh, he's just the right soul to be on our team. And I looked at her, and see, this is one of our sibling power struggles. It's not our team. You're joining our team, John. You're coming to, to our vibration. You know, it's like he's so cute because he takes ownership now, kind of like he did down here, but from a real expanded way. And that, that humor comes through over and over and over again. Uh, there's so many stories that I'd love to tell you. The one that I really, uh, I really wanted to talk about Harvey, but the other one was when he first tells me through a medium uh, session with, with uh, Samantha, this was kind of early on, I think it was in that first one. He says, you know, he said, I'm here for you. You know, it's like, we've got stuff to do. And he said, just think of me as your ambassador, right? Well, as you'll see in the story, it's like, there's a turning point, and if I have time, I'm going to read it. I probably have gone way over already, so I won't. But there's a point at John's, uh, um, I won't read it, but I'll tell you real quick. There's a point at John's uh, celebration of life where, of course, I'm inspired to get to the podium and talk about some of my spiritual relationships and experiences where, you know, I'm kind of out of touch with the probably not a lot of people are there with me, but it's like I was inspired. And one of the uh, statements John had made to me at one point was, you know, when we were having a lot of talks, he said, he said you know, I got to tell you, Kat, you know, a lot of my conversations are with dead people. And so I shared that story and, and said, you know, so John wants me to tell you, if you want to talk to him, he will be glad to have conversations, you know, so I was planting the seed. Well, I'm inspired afterwards, you know, I leave the podium and I see this friend, of his and by this time people have had quite a few drinks and so I walk over to this friend and he's kind of a friend of the family and I'm on a roll right so I have one more story and I start sharing it uh, with this friend and I'm not kind of reading the room which is my favorite saying so I don't realize that I'm kind of losing him I also am not really tracking that by this time he's had a lot of drinks so one of the the uh, infamous quotes in the book is I tell him the story about some, you know, after John's life thing and, and his friend kind of pauses and then he looks at me and he says, you know, I've got to tell you, Kathy, for most of the time, John thought you were a real kook. And that frames it, he, you know, that held it. And so this book is written for all of you out there that have felt that scrutiny because that encaptured most of my relationship to John on that side. And so one of the things that I was going to read, and I don't think I will because it'd be another 10 minutes and there's other things we want to do, but, but it's John and I, I kind of started the book out with John and I at the celebration at the end of this book, which at the time I had this meditation, I thought it was the end, and we're celebrating, right? And, and we're sitting there and we're just sharing what the experience was. And it gives the reader up front kind of a preview of what's going to happen. And at the very end, John kind of looks at me and he says, you know, I really want to thank you for holding, you know, for hanging in there, you know, and we're giving each other kind of compliments. And, and um, I say to him, yeah, you know, we've really come a long way since, that last celebration when your friend so eloquently said, you know, most of the time, John thought you were a real kook. And John kind of pauses and, and uh, he says, you know, I just didn't know what I didn't know. 
And then there's a couple other things that happen in, um, we've been talking about trying to figure out what the name of the book is. And after he says that, he says, you know, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I kind of pause and, and there's a lot of moments where he gets what I call his shit eating grin and says something funny and I, get that, this is my turn to do it. And with tongue in cheek, I look at him and I say, <laughs> you know, John, I think I like you better dead. And we start laughing so much that we're spitting beer all over ourselves and, you know, and then we just pause and we realize that's the name of the book. It shows the reverence and irreverence of this whole experience. And that introduces the reader to the book. And so I want to show you the book, uh, the old one. We, Brian, we want to show the first one because this is a way that John worked with me. And we got the title of the book and my, my husband and I, who's a graphic artist, we started working with it. And so we came up with this first one and we were so inspired with it. Can you share your screen and show us? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it right now and just let me know. So, so not the one you sent this morning. You want the first one first? Right. That's okay. the good oh. one. Okay. Hold on a second. <laughs> You'll understand why when you see this and I've just got to this one here. The, uh, the rabbit, the rabbit in the black. This one. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, now when I saw this, I came from, the excitement about the title. And I thought first it was going to be black and white. And so we were bringing color and it was dynamic. And even the, the, the red, it was like, no, that really pops, you know? So I started sending this out to people because I'm at the place now where I'm wanting people like Brian and Russell and other friends to kind of look at it. And I'm gathering little quotes for it. And we were so excited about this. And I started getting people responding and saying, you know, your, tire, your, your cover really took me back. It kind of scared me, you know? And, and so Arthur and I looked at it again, and Arthur says, well, it does kind of look like a 1920s Agatha Christie, you know, murder thing, especially with the dead. And it's find out why in the first five pages, you know? And so then once I started hearing that, I couldn't look at it the same way. Pretty soon I felt like, um, like the character from Psycho, you know, that I think I like you dead, 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 you know? So I thought, okay. So that night I, I kind of go to bed and I say to John, I said, Houston, we have a problem because what we thought was so great, we're scaring people down here. We got to change it. And so I said, work on that and show me what to do the next morning. So then the next morning we started working on it and we liked the, the graphics but we started softening the colors. So now, Brian, if you bring up the second, the second one and the, the other rabbit. Coming right up. There we go. And this is still, you know, a work in progress, but it's softer and not everybody's gonna get the fact that the rabbit's Harvey, but they certainly will, you know, when they read it. And, so what I loved about that is the collaboration and the cooperativeness. And it really showed me how, when I was kind of, you know, vibrating to, to John's uh, perspective, because he's assured me that the book's already in print, it's like that worked in that other dimension. But as Abraham talks about, we are part of the co-creation. And I had to bring it back down into third dimensional reality and get some feedback on it's not gonna work. And so that's such an example of how the other side really wants to work with this and how we can collaborate. Before we go into kind of the last part of this, I, the one thing I really wanna say is how much those that wanna communicate on the other side really wanna communicate. They are so eager for you if you feel inspired to talk to them, to make them real. They've got sometimes so many regrets, they wanna clean those up. They've got things they wanna share. There's other scholars, like as we're writing, 
this book and I've got another book I'm working on. It's like now John's helping me connect with, like I'm writing one on addictions and I'm having conversations with Bill W and with, you know, Wayne Dyer and people that still want to bring things through. And if we're portals, they will be our periscope. So that's what I want to talk about with the book. Um, Brian, if you want to go anywhere before we do the video, then I'll talk about the video when we get to that point. But yeah. the book hopefully will be ready in November. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Catherine. Um, there were many moments throughout where I could <clears throat> start imagining the incredible value and healing that these types of conversations could have. And I think for many of us, including me, the, the idea of it is so unimaginable that um, now it's possible. And I really got that through your sharing today and I appreciate it. And before we go into the good news, I would just love to give you know anyone here the opportunity to, to ask a question or share a comment. Um, so I'm just gonna look around here and anyone who would like to wave at me or Okay, I see Cheryl Ramsey. Go for it. Okay, so I always thought that when you tried to communicate with the dead that we might be hindering them from going further that that they should where further where they should go. Are we are we doing that if we try to? Cuz I really want to connect with my dad. You know, I that was a question I had. And there's a piece in the book where John, he's just gone to this class on multidimensionality. And what he explains is there's a continuum. And he said, this is one of the reasons your inner child work is so effective. Because when you take people back down on that timeline to their inner child, there is a vibrational um, uh, signature of that inner child. It's not a memory. They're not making it up. When we get to this other side, we have all these vibrational signatures. So there will always be a vibrational signature of me as your brother. There's already an aspect of John's soul that's gone into another life. He said, there's so many dimensions that you will never take me away from what I'm doing because I'm not limited now. I can be in a lot of different places at one time. It's not like when you're down there. And so I'm glad you brought that up, Cheryl, because that was one of my concerns. I don't want to hold you back. I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to make this up. I don't want to forget my own zip code because I'm spending so much time with you. You know, it's like, so those are really, really fair questions. But what I have learned a lot uh, more about is the incredible multidimensionality. And it's come in so handy for me now with the crisis that our planet's in. Because I've talked a lot uh, to this group about the continuum with the, with the coronavirus and where are you on that you know, chain of healing and where we have to be on, on um, different levels of it and how can we not spiritually bypass what's going on and still be present but not get lost in you know, the, the, the density of the, the tension, the tension, you know, and so that's one of writing, that's one of the things that writing this book has really concretized, which is one of my favorite words, solidified for me is we're not limited. And no, it, that may not be true for everyone, but, but it opened up the possibility that if they're showing up and making themselves available, they won't. And there's times, and this happens with me with the Akashic Records, where I'll open the record to somebody, and if that soul is not in a position to come through, there's a curtain that's, that's uh, drawn. Or if we're asking, and we're asking about a relationship with somebody on the other side, and it's our, not ours to, be, to know, a curtain's drawn. So the, the record keepers won't go to places where uh, they won't spiritually um, uh, stalk another person you know and so it's a long answer but it's a big question so thank you for raising it and there's there's more about that in the book when i get it done 
Yeah, that was a that was a great question. I'm sure it was on a lot of minds. Um, so I just am going down the list that I have here. So I got Carl first. Go for it. Yeah, Carl Benner, go. You got to unmute yourself. Okay, there we are. There you go. Does that work? Okay, thanks. Hey, Catherine. Hi. How you doing, my dear? I'm good. Carl's one of those that's on my team for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to see you on this thing, and and uh, I just wanted to tell everyone that uh, that has any interest at all in your book or even your story, just to even to hear it from you. I think it's a tremendous tool for everyone and a wonderful account of what's actually possible with what's uh, out there on the other side. And uh, what I've seen in your book so far is that you've written it in a way that is relatable. It sounds, I mean, you write like you talk. You know, I read that excerpt and I felt like you were just, we we're hanging out in your house, just like that right there, what you see on the screen. And you were just telling me the story, you know. It was, yeah. it was really cool that way. So I highly recommend your book to begin with. And uh, one thing uh, I wanted to touch upon is that I actually had an experience uh, uh, my wife and I actually had an experience a couple, three, four years ago. It was after my dad had passed away at the age of 100. And it was about one year after to the day where he uh, came to my wife, Susan, somehow. And it wasn't as profound as your experiences, but basically what long story short is that it was revealed that even though he'd been faithfully, happily married to her, my mother for many, many years, 60 some years, something, uh, that uh, he had actually been married married before that, and that was a family secret, which explained why there were never any family reunions on his side of the family, because we were forbidden to meet anybody who would know and spill the beans all these years. Oh, wow. It wasn't until one year after dad passed away that he went through us to explain what happened and give us the tools to uh, wow. you know, check into that life that he had before. Um, but... Uh, so, I mean, and, and on the one side, I just wanted to comment that what you're saying in your book, Catherine, is very detailed and very personal, and you're actually like physically, for all practical purposes, you're physically there with your brother. But communication from the other side can also come in forms of just ideas. Yes. And you act on yes. them. One idea leads to another. You peel back the layers of the onion. So uh, I think uh, what you've done is, is a wonderful sort of a groundbreaking uh, a piece of literature that uh, people should really check into, even if they're just kind of mildly curious, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so I just want to let you know. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Carl. Yeah, I can totally relate. I feel the same way about Catherine's work. It's literally like she's just sitting there with you, participating mm -hmm. in the reading. And yeah, I have the same comment. And um, Carol Patty, go for it. Oh. You're, you're unmuted. You're good to go. Okay, great. Uh, Captain, I, I just wanted to say that this conversation was so profound um, and made this reality, I mean, just brought it to, to realness for me. Because I also go through these doubts and I'm wondering how you dealt with the doubt when, you know, you were getting messages and, uh, you know, and you weren't sure it was real. How did you work through that? Well, that's what I feel like I, that, you know, I had all the tools, but I also had the support system. And I had the, the, uh, remember when I talked about the stages of grief in one of these talks? Yeah. I have such a respect for the stages of grief that when I needed to be back down, I did. And, um, and support like Carl and Don and Timothy and Wes. And my husband's have been a tremendous support. And I, like I said, I had friends, you know, hey, what's new with you and John? Or, you know, God, I just don't know if this is true. I think that the hardest part for me is that there was such a contrast between when I sit in that chair as a consultant and a facilitator, I had none of this. You know, it's like I never doubt. But this was up close and personal. And I was, you know, not kind of tuning into my, the, the amorphous feeling of my soul and my angels. I was tuning into a vibrational frequency of um, my brother, John, and, you know, the, the dimensions of that and the porous 
ness of that, of how he kind of begins to evaporate and the grief I had to go with that. And so I used a lot of the skills of grief. I used a lot of the inner child stuff. Um, and uh, I cried a lot. I wrote a lot. And I laughed a lot. You know, and I would call friends and say, God, have I gone over the edge here? You know, is this really happening? It's like, now I don't have that. And, and I'll share one little last story when we get to the video of how every day this is to me now. You know, so thank so it, you. So it became a knowingness for you. You just got to a place where you just knew. Absolutely. And, and w without an attachment to needing other people to agree because I have enough people that support me. And in, at one point, John said, you know, I kept saying, John, if any of your friends ever read this, they're going to think I'm nuts. And he said, that's not your audience. Don't worry mm. about that. He said, mm. if you tell somebody, you know, oh yeah, I'm walking and talking and, you know, with my dead brother, he said, a lot of them are going to laugh. Mm. And I said, I know, remember you were one of them. <laughs> You know, and so, but that was like a year ago. You know, now it's just so in tandem and I know when he's here, I know when he's not. If I want him to be gone, I say, okay, you know, you, you can leave now. And, and he's real respectful and, and we just have so much fun together. And we were raised with a level of humor that feels so wonderful to be there. And, um, I'm really glad that question came up about if I'm keeping him back or if he's keeping me because that was something I had to address. I'm looking thank forward to reading your book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Great question, comment. Um, so, Catherine, I think we'll, we'll move to the video. Um, and I think that'll just be a good way to wrap up. And I, I've, already, I've already seen it, so I know that it'll bring a lot to all of us. So um, as I'm setting it up, why don't you go ahead and, and introduce it? And um, don't mind me, I'm just gonna set up the screen share, but just introduce it for everybody. Okay, well, what's magical about this is it's a homespun video that I did. You've heard me talk about Sean, our nephew, and you'll read about him in the book, but this is a song that Sean wrote probably, you know, um, a decade ago, but what's magical, and then I put pictures to it. And so it, it's definitely not professionally perfect, but it, but you'll get the idea. What's cool about this is the 18th was Sean's birthday. And so I did my morning meditation. And when I was done with my meditation, all of a sudden my cell phone kicks over to three songs from Sean's, uh, Sean's album that this is on. And I didn't cue that. And that's an example of how John works with me now. And it was his way of, A, wanting me to tell Sean that he, happy birthday. And two, one of them was this song. And he, so this song is really inspired and impulsed by John reminding me that I even had made this. So, and, and it's just, it's, the, the words are, are just perfect to complete this. Awesome. Well, here we go. And Catherine, just give me a thumbs up that the sound quality is good and we will start. I want to enlarge it or not. Oh, you can hear it? I can hear it. Okay, great. And he asks me, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, I'm feeling kind of lost and I need assistance Cause I'm looking at the path of the least resistance If you got some wisdom, won't you please fill it? He said, do you believe the future is mapped out before? We breathe a breath on this earth I thought it was random, no gods or angels, determining what was world. So take a good look at the path you're on, is it what you bargained for? Cause fate will 
will open up the gate to happiness, but you gotta walk through the door. For today, but don't delay. That's a big mistake. Cause you got it made. As long as you say each day, that's just the path I'm on today. I had a life many moons ago, and then I took a wrong turn cause they told me so. And now I've got no choice but to regret it. Life is tough at this intersection Just keep moving forward in the right direction Cause it's your life, just go and live it Take a good look at the path you're on Is it what you bargained for? Cause fate will open up the gate to happiness But you gotta walk through And when you get there, you can stay, and you can play, you can live what you dreamt for today. But don't delay, that's a big mistake, cause you got it made, as long as you say each day. That's just the path I'm on today And I won't back down And I won't turn away From the things that get in my way On the path I'm on today And I won't break down And I won't turn away From the things that get in my way On the path I'm on today Okay, well, <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful message. Um, and thank you, Catherine, for sharing it and for being with all of us today. And that, uh, you know, I can look around and I can see that that message was held by everybody here. And um, it's, our, it's our opportunity to just go out into the world and into our lives and, um, and hold, hold that message and hold what Catherine has shared with us today.
let's all do that and unmute ourselves and virtually hug and we only exist because we're all here together. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, thank Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Brian, Megan, Russell. Never hurts. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Hi, Pat. Thanks for including me. Bye. Hey, Kat. Love you, dear. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.